Can a video game be great without being very good? Without getting bogged down in subjective ideas of what makes something good or great? I'll define a good game as something that has technical stability and a consistent balance of challenge and rewards that captures and sustains a player's attention and interest. Fallout 76 has none of those things. What it does have, though, is something much more difficult to define in terms of technical or narrative design. It's something that happens between the player and the game if the player is willing to go along with it. This video is about what that something is and why that something allows Fallout 76 to bypass conventional ideas of what makes a game good and to become something better than good. Or I should say, to become part of a rarefied category of video games whose deficiencies are so numerous, so egregious at times, that they must be seen not as mistakes, but as embedded in the design. Players of Fallout 76 at some point have to choose whether to reject the game for not being good, or to suffer its annoyances in order to realize its potential. Like the labors of Hercules, Fallout 76 throws obstacles at you that seem impossible to overcome, and not in the usual way a video game might challenge your cognitive abilities, perception, or reflexes. You have to think outside of the game in order to crack its code. And while you're doing that, other players are doing the same thing, but differently. Or they just give up because it's not a good game, and then they put videos and posts on the internet about all the glitches, how the story sucks and it's a total ripoff, and so on and so on. This video will not be one of those. Fallout 76, released in 2018 by Bethesda Softworks, has a beginning. This much we can all agree on. A beginning familiar to players of previous Fallout games. Your as yet unnamed character awakens from an unconscious state, sleep in this case, and a bit hungover from a party the previous night and goes through a compelling, well-orchestrated chain of tutorials. Compelling because we are living in a post-apocalyptic environment, in this case the Appalachian mountain areas of West Virginia and Maryland. Well-orchestrated because the game explains its basic systems of health, skills, and inventory management by letting you pick up things and make choices from a series of simple tasks. And then you emerge once again, not into consciousness, but out into the open world where your character will be spending the rest of his or her existence in the game. A world that looks beautiful. Nothing stands in your way. You can walk from one end of Appalachia to the other without even taking off your party hat. The world is your oyster. The only limits are of your imagination. Uh, oh wait, hang on. Those young ladies down there, they seem exceedingly... Alive. They haven't yet made any untoward advances, but perhaps you could speak to them? Verify their intentions are civil? Okay, alright. Do be careful out there, Mum. Thanks, appreciate it. Okay, where was I? Oh yes, the vast open world inviting you to explore its soothing riverbeds, its deep aquatic caves, its quiet forest trails, its... Oh, who's this? Just a friend here, not a threat. Just had some questions for you. You came out of the vault, right? I thought it was empty. Wait, is the door still open? I don't know if there's a right or a wrong answer here, but whatever. God damn it. <sighs> We got a tip from the Wayward. Heard of the place? A new bar down the road. Oh, right. I gotta go to the Wayward. The game is telling me to visit the Wayward. And as a level 2 scrub, what other choice do I have? I could, but no, I cannot just walk from one end of Appalachia to the other. If I do that, I won't get very far. These little level 2 robots standing in my way are going to be level 20 robots soon enough, so I better get to the wayward. And pick up a few things along the way, they'll probably be useful. Got my little 10mm pistol, and oh, there's a kitty cat! A kitty cat that, spoiler alert, never leaves that spot. Ever. You can't pet it, you can't tame it, you can just look at it. 
And later on, when you get a camera, if you remember where the cat is, you can come back here and take a picture of it, which will earn a small part of an in-game photography challenge, which, when completed, will give the player a small amount of one of the game's many currencies. But I'm getting ahead of myself. The point is, you don't know anything about anything in Fallout 76 the first time you see it. All this junk you can pick up. And yes, the game is refreshing by its honesty in calling these material items junk. You have no idea how it might be useful. Except you know it must be useful for something. Your goal as a player, you sooner or later realize, is figuring out what that something is. What you can possibly do with this junk. And you hope you'll have the right junk, or whatever else is required to get that something that you don't yet know exists, and that you don't yet know if you want it, if and when you do find out it does exist. In the meantime, let's deal with what's right in front of us. The game tells us to make some armor and gives us the junk we need to make it. And while we're at it, let's make a better gun. And maybe get rid of this funny looking Vault 76 jumpsuit and party hat, and make something a little more fashionable for the post-apocalyptic Appalachian wasteland. And we are finally off to the wayward and oh, who's this? It's another player about whom I know nothing except their level, username, and avatar. Hey there, just a level two scrub passing through. Now we know what game we're playing, if we didn't know that already. See, this isn't Fallout 1, Fallout 2, Fallout 3, or Fallout 4. Those are single player RPGs. Fallout 76 is a massive multiplayer online RPG, and you will be encountering other players along the way, many of whom will interact with you. Although this particular player isn't interacting with me because as a level 384, he probably has better things to do than hang out at the Wayward with a level two scrub like me. Welcome to Fallout 76. I'm not going to bore you with an exhaustive summary of the game's plot lines, quest lines, and general mechanics. Other videos have done this at length and spend a lot of what I think is wasted time complaining about this stuff. Suffice to say, for the first 100 levels of the game, your character swerves between a railroaded series of quests involving NPCs, much like the previous Fallout games, to the more randomized and downright chaotic events and social encounters that remind you that you are not alone. In a sense, you are playing two games at once. First, a more traditional, self-contained Fallout adventure, where you build your character's skills and equipment by leveling up, and making a few story-based decisions that affect your relationships with various NPC factions, settlers, military groups, scientists, religious cultists, and so on. And second, a sprawling online playground of activity with other characters operated by actual humans, just like you. Like previous Fallout games, your progress is saved at regular intervals. Unlike previous Fallout games, you cannot load a save or take back any choice that you made, even if it's a terrible one. Your character may die and will die a lot, but will always respawn. The ultimate goal of the game, therefore, is not survival. It's also not achieving any kind of productive relationship with an NPC faction, although that can be a secondary goal. Maximizing your reputation with the industrious settlers or the marauding raiders ends nothing in the game except what seems like a hundred hours of daily questing in order to maximize those reputations. Choosing a faction just opens up a whole new currency and range of options to enhance your character. And you can still deal with the factions you didn't choose, creating more options for buying and trading. In previous Fallout games, after choosing your faction and battling it out with other factions in a climactic showdown, you can continue exploring the open world, but there isn't much left to discover unless you want to start all over again and roleplay as a different character, making different choices. In Fallout 76, showdowns in the main questline might feel climactic, but they really aren't. Instead of ending the game, they give your character a new beginning. In Fallout 76, the linear questline has no satisfactory ending for a reason. It is simply the means to another ending. It is the beginning of your decision of how you want to end it. And it gives you a lot to think about. 
In other words, the linear quest line upon completion turns into a non-linear quest line. You have already made all the big decisions affecting the game world and its NPC inhabitants. Now you have to make the more difficult, but much more rewarding decision, what to do with yourself. Some players, I would dare say most players, don't even bother going all the way to the end of the linear quest line because they get completely caught up in the development of their own characters or campsite and the pre-designed linear quest line just isn't as compelling. This is why I feel we have a tremendous lack of in-depth analysis and commentary on Fallout 76. We could blame other things. The game had a notorious botched release in 2018 that still haunts it today. Its online format undercuts the patented Fallout experience of saving and reloading to make alternate decisions in a complex branching narrative. It's more like Skyrim in its lackadaisical approach to narrative, but less like Skyrim in its randomized liveness. Fallout 76 repeats a lot of what people hated about Fallout 4, the radial quests given by NPCs, and the bizarre disconnect between the characters' motives and the players. Fallout 4 tells you to go find your lost child and to make huge decisions that will impact the game world. Meanwhile, you'd rather spend your time farming the ingredients to build your dream home in the wasteland. Fallout 76 seems to understand this, and instead of trying to redirect you back into a more compelling narrative, it gives you the keys to the kingdom and says, don't worry about it. The wasteland couldn't care less about who you are and what you're doing. Just have fun. That puts a lot of people off, and a lot of critics and players many of whom should know better, reject it. Analysis and commentary about Fallout 76 on YouTube and message boards tend to focus on the game's failures of stability and engagement. Or if the critics are engaged, it's with the game's inherent stabilities and glitches, which are numerous, prevalent, and often hilarious. I could do that too. Here's a random wacky glitch I encountered near my camp which is set up near a little destroyed house occupied by an NPC character. I hear some gunfire near my cooking station and come to check it out. My NPC neighbor is firing her gun at some unseen object or presence. She's shooting and flailing at something. I, I, just, I, I, I join in the madness, shooting my own gun at the whatever. We'll get this. Finally, I figure maybe it's one of those pink lawn flamingos I set up at the camp that's causing a fuss. I move the two of them and see what happens. Once I moved it, the NPC could destroy it and, thus satisfied, wanders off without a word. I can make a whole video like this and call it something like Fallout 76's best glitches and get comments saying thanks Bugthesda and call it a day. And I really do wish more people had more to say about this game. Other common criticisms, besides the glitches and the stupid AI, there's the vast open world where, after finishing the main storyline, there is, quote, nothing to do except a revolving series of short-term, repeatable quests with or without the presence of other players on the live service. And then there's the humorous tone and general absurdity of the whole situation that makes players think the joke is on them. The wasteland shouldn't be fun, they say. We should be immersed in a gripping, post-apocalyptic nightmare. 
making tough decisions that have world-changing consequences. And instead, we have this. Not the sort of thing you'd see in YouTube highlight reels or in listicles of the best gaming moments ever. And yet, with all that being true and accounted for, Fallout 76 is still a great game. I don't expect this video to change anybody's mind about that, but I hope it does point the way forward to a more productive way of seeing why it's so great. Notice, first of all, that all of the above criticisms have to do with a player's response to things, a consumer response to a defective product. If a player sees themselves as a demanding customer with a complaint sheet at the ready, Fallout 76 will fill it up in minutes, if not seconds. Just ask Luke Stevens. I mentioned this on stream, but the way that I would probably describe Fallout 76 after playing it for a couple of days is that I think it is almost like a, a sort of crappy meal that you get at a restaurant you went to when you were a kid that you have like a lot of nostalgic bias towards. But in the end, this is just reactive criticism to reactive gameplay. If you play Fallout 76 with a reactive mindset, that you are nothing more than a responsive eye and ear to a deeply flawed design, then yes, the game could feel like torture, an endless running in place in a virtual hamster wheel of open world mediocrity. But what if you reversed that mindset into a more proactive one? What if you took all the design flaws as a given, as a necessary evil almost, and decided that you don't have to do anything you don't want to do? And that there is something you could do, something you do want, that you know the game is offering you, only you have to decide for yourself what that is, how to get it, and then focus your gameplay on that thing and nothing else. To use Luke Stevens's analogy of the disappointed customer at a restaurant, did you know that you don't have to sit unhappy at your table while the restaurant serves you one bad dish after another? You can get up from the table, go back into the kitchen, and cook the meal yourself. Once you come to that realization, if you can put up with the way Fallout 76 partitions its content across several systems of currency and progression, the game will open up in a new direction. You decide where it begins, where it's going, and where it ends. As a reactive experience, Fallout 76 is a disaster. As a proactive experience, however, it's a revelation. So let me share my proactive experience. I first played Fallout 76 in early 2021, got through the main questline and most of the available DLC, then decided I wasn't sure where to go next and quit at level 81. This photo taken in-game commemorates that decision. As I left my character asleep in bed at the edge of her camp in the forest area at the west end of Appalachia. Fast forward a year and a half later, I downloaded Fallout 76 again, and after a delightful shock that the game remembered me after my uninstall from 2021, I had to figure out what to do with my level 81 character. Since 2021, a lot more DLC had been added, which gave me things to do, but who was I? Besides my camp, a humble deconstruction of a cabin in the woods, and what I had left in my inventory and available perks, not much remained from that earlier playthrough. I couldn't remember much of anything about the storyline or the main quests, or what DLC faction I'm allied with, turns out it was neither of them, or what my character was trying to be. My Fallout 76 avatar had rematerialized like a forgotten friend whose memory had been erased and that I could reprogram like a cyborg. I needed a way forward. And so I ignored the quest lines and dug into the game's various systems to see the possibilities. What could I do with this character? I knew what I did not want to do, and that was what everyone else seemed to be doing. Creating an overpowered warrior in heavy armor, toting around an automatic rifle or a Gatling gun. That's the meta. Specifically, a bloodied stealth commando. Bloodied meaning running a character on very low health, less than 20%, in order to increase weapon damage by up to 95%, if it has a bloodied legendary effect on it. Furthermore, if you have a full set of armor with the unyielding legendary effect, 
Your skill points are raised by 15 each, giving you a lot more strength, perception, intelligence, charisma, agility, and luck. Most characters above level 100 are following the meta, or some variation of it. You can tell by the low health, high radiation gauges on these characters when they are part of your team, and yes, most of them appear in some kind of power armor which increases their bulk, durability, and radiation resistance so they can carry these heavy guns like portable cannons whose bullets are constantly spraying into whatever enemy comes into range. I actually like one half of this meta, the low health, high skill part with light, unyielding armor. I do not like the power armor, bullet spraying behemoth part of the meta. In power armor, your visual display takes on a lot of clutter and your clomping footsteps sound like Robocop, a character I enjoy watching but don't want to be. My character travels light and prefers more exotic weaponry like small energy guns, bows and arrows, and pistols. In an earlier Fallout game, when building your character, the obvious way forward would be to increase your chosen skills with each level up, and with better skills you get better gear. A linear path that is no less linear because you chose it yourself. If you play an earlier Fallout game as, for example, a sniper invested in critical hit damage, yes, you chose that identity out of the range of possible options. So did a lot of other players. Your experience as a critical hit sniper, or as a heavy machine gunner, or as a sneaky ninja type, won't be much different than other players who made the same decisions. Fallout 76 changes this up by expanding the range of options and multiplying the systems you have to navigate to get what you want. In Fallout 76, everything you interact with is a form of currency, and none of it is in dollars. One of the better running jokes of the series is the collapse of the dollar economy. Now known as pre-war money, dollar bills are only worth their weight in cloth, which you can scrap to make other things like clothing. The primary currency in the Fallout world is bottle caps because of their relative scarcity, but it's not that simple. First of all, bottle caps are not all that scarce. I actually have trouble getting rid of them at times. More importantly, bottle caps only get you some of what the game has to offer. If you really want a unique character that can hold her own on the battlefield and have fun doing it, you must come to terms with the game's many currencies. As in life, you don't get something for nothing in Fallout 76, and the game seems to know what you might want the most because those things are the hardest to get. You want a simple bow and arrow? Easy! All you have to do is undertake a series of repeatable short quests for either the Settlers faction or the Raiders faction. At the end of each quest, your reputation with that faction increases by a very small amount. I spent weeks getting my reputation with one faction up to ally status, which unlocked the ability to purchase not a bow and arrow, but the plans to make a bow and arrow. And then when you get the plans for the bow and arrow, you need the materials to make it. And once you've made it, you need the materials to make modifications, like for example, a fire mod to make flaming arrows, or an explosive mod to play Rambo in the mountains. They cost additional caps, but also additional materials, including the all-powerful Stable Flux a rare material whose ingredients come from dangerous blast zones created by a player who dropped a nuclear bomb. You can wait for a player to do this for you, or you can go through the slog of doing it yourself, infiltrating a nuclear silo and launching a nuke after a grueling marathon of fighting with the robot security force. After the bomb hits its target, you have to face the hazards of its intense radiation and superpowered glowing enemies just to pick some flowers so you can get a mod for your bow and arrow, which already by itself took a month of daily questing to get one. Why go through all of this? You really want a bow and arrow, that's why. For reasons that have nothing to do with the meta, or with any game narrative driven decision. My reason for getting archery items? I want to be Legolas from the Lord of the Rings, firing off arrows in rapid succession, 
each one hitting its target with deadly accuracy. And you know what? Once everything came together, I was Legolas. Now, watching this video doesn't quite capture the feeling behind it. From the outside, you'd look at this and say, well, that's nice, but so what? And if you know the game and you know the meta, which is Robocop Commando, and you believe in the meta, you might say that this event I'm showing, Guided Meditation, is an easy event. And of course, the enemies are going to go down in one shot, whether it's a bow and arrow or a pea shooter. Can I, fake Legolas, do that with a Scorch Beast Queen or at a more difficult event? Well, yes and, and no, but that's not the point. Archery might not be the meta of Fallout 76, but if you decide to make it your niche interest and you commit an enormous amount of time and effort to make it happen, you can have a viable build that is so much more fun and satisfying because it is an odd choice and you don't have to do what it seems like everyone else is doing. Considering the range of choices you can make in this game, I've barely scratched the surface. The one part of the meta I do like, having low health and unyielding armor, has you trading in gold bullion. Gold bullion is earned by exchanging for treasury notes, which are earned as a reward for public events and a few daily quests. One event might get you between two and four treasury notes. Each treasury note you can turn in for 10 gold bullion. The plans to create a full set of the best light armor in the game, secret service armor sold by Regs, who hangs out cool as a cucumber in Vault 79, will cost you at least 10,000 gold bullion if you also want modifications for it. So you do the math. One event or quest averaging about 30 gold bullion each as reward means you have to complete about 300 events or daily quests. 300. That is more quests than the entirety of Fallout 4 to get plans for a set of armor. Once you get the plans, now you have to craft the armor. We've been over this already about weapons and modifications. Same deal with armor. You need the plans and you need the ingredients. Only with the Secret Service armor, you also have to spend what are called legendary modules. This is yet another currency of the game that you earn either as rewards for finishing certain quests or more commonly by turning in unwanted weapons and armor that are affixed with a legendary prefix giving them enhanced traits. In exchange for another currency called Scrip, you get enough Scrip from rewards and exchanges, you can purchase modules from a trader named the Purveyor and use those modules not only to make your basic set of Secret Service armor, but to roll the dice on getting your own legendary prefix for each piece of armor and any weapon that you want to enhance. Quick pause. If you have never played Fallout 76, everything I just said about it, which is all about grinding to a satisfying payoff, might make you not want to play it. Understandably so, but trust me, if you play this game long enough, and if you commit to a plan to get something specific out of it, Everything I just said about the grinding should be an incentive and not a warning because of your commitment. As I said before, nothing in this game is handed to you. Actually, I'll take that back. Quite a lot is handed to you, uh, but nothing you actually want is handed to you. That was my point. Unless you have extraordinary luck with rolls and drops. Okay, back to my story. But before I get to my last point and wrap this up, I want to talk about luck. In Fallout 76, luck can get you things much quicker than simple grinding. I would call that the game's biggest drawback, the way luck is always a factor, even though it shouldn't be. And it's about those legendary prefixes. Those things are randomly applied to weapons and armor pieces out of a pool of a few dozen or so. Items can appear as legendary rewards with prefixes already on them, or more likely, you try to get your own desired prefix applied by spending hard-earned legendary modules on a roll at your workbench. But a roll is more likely to be a dud than a winner. Luckily, I managed to get a full set of unyielding Secret Service armor after I don't know how many rolls, 
maybe 50 or so, costing about 200 modules. Other players are luckier, other players are not so lucky. This goes for weapons too. You want a bloodied weapon that matches your unyielding armor set, increasing its damage the lower your health? You can find another player who has one already and is willing to sell it to you, or, more likely, you're rolling random legendary mods at your workbench, spending hard-earned modules to do so. I do not recommend this. Among the things you want to have and want to be in Fallout 76, I recommend not wanting something that depends entirely on luck. You might want a quad explosive automatic railway rifle with increased critical hit chance, you may want an anti-armor plasma rifle with an aligned flamer barrel, and if you're lucky, one might drop into your lap. If you're not lucky, but you think you need those things, you are going to be throwing away time, resources, and your sense of sanity on endless pulls at the slot machine disguised as your workbench. The RNG gods have forsaken you, and the more you pull that lever and get worse than zilch, the more you start feeling like a character in a Samuel Beckett play, rolling for the sake of rolling, an existential crisis whose only cure is oblivion. What you do want, I discovered, is something very specific to you that depends on knowledge of the game's systems and the commitment of time and effort to get that specific thing. Not pure luck, but simple repetitive activity. Simple repetitive activity. Sounds easy? Depending on what you want, it might be easy. If all you want to do is walk around, take in the atmosphere, spy on a bunch of other players, you can do that easily. Or you can decide to be an oddball and deck yourself out in a wild array of clothing and equipment and camp decorations and feel like a unique presence in Appalachia, no matter how many other player characters you encounter. That is not so easy but so much more rewarding. My oddball character expanded her niche interest from energy weapons and bows and arrows to that other unsung archetype, the lowly pistol. When I needed a break from Legolas, I wanted to roleplay Calamity Jane. Like energy weapons and bows and arrows, pistols are the other anti-meta something non-optimal that I want to make viable. This reflects my tendency to root for the underdog, the outcast, the unloved. So back I went to regs after earning more gold bullion and got myself plans for the Crusader pistol, a lovely little hand cannon that shoots cryo bullets and does what bows and arrows can do only quicker. My taste for the exotic, though, took me back to the energy weapon anti-meta, and I made myself a pistol flamer that melted whatever it hit, but only in a limited range. I thought I'd hit the mega jackpot though when I came across a quad alien blaster in another player's vendor. With an expanded magazine and cryo receiver, it was totally worth the 10,000 caps that I paid for it. When you reach a certain level of wealth and knowledge, you start splurging on yourself. As Agent Cooper says, Every day, once a day, give yourself a present. Don't plan it, don't wait for it, just let it happen. Not bad advice for a Fallout 76 player. For me, the Alien Blaster hit all the right notes. A lightning fast fire rate, a pew pew sound effect out of a cheesy space opera, and its beautiful luminescent rounds that streak across the air in a glowing arc. I would call this gun probably the luckiest thing I found in the entire game. In my hundreds of visits to other players' vendors, this was the only alien blaster I'd ever seen, and it was pre-modded for someone at just my level of experience and eccentricity. With all this in hand, an embarrassment of riches, you'd think I'd have found my endgame, but I really hadn't. I looked for new challenges. Did I mention the badge system that rewards incredibly convoluted in-game challenges sorted by categories, like entomologist and cook, Complete these challenges and you earn badges, another currency that you can trade for rare clothing and decorations. And I don't even want to mention the Expeditions, a pair of special quests set in Pittsburgh, known as The Pit, that rewards players with stamps, yet another currency, 
Stamps are traded for rare items, but as you can see, the prices are steep. One expedition can reward up to eight stamps. Here I am with about 80, so I've done about 10 expeditions, and I cannot afford the cheapest things in the stamp vendor's inventory. You do well to remember that. Am I going to spend a hundred hours grinding out these two missions to get more stamps? I don't want anything on this list, so why would I? I also don't want anything you can get with badges. So why would I do any of those world challenges? It's not like they're hard, it's just not what I want to do. And Fallout 76, in its infinite disregard for the player, is A-OK -okay with that. But what did I want? to run around in circles watching my level number tick higher and higher while I use an admittedly fun but limited set of gear and amuse myself watching other players strut their stuff, I tried to get into sneaking. I don't call it stealth, by the way. Stealth is a fancy poser word for sneaking. But sneaking only works when you're by yourself. When taking over a nuclear silo, for example, Invisibility is a must. In public events, though, you're surrounded by other players who break your sneak ability, and even if you're alone in some public events, the game will automatically cancel any sneak options. More fun, in a limited way, was playing around with mutations. I had never even heard of mutations the first hundred levels I played this game. You can get one of 19 different mutations by irradiating yourself in the game world, but that's a roll of the dice. What you want are specific mutations. Something that makes you jump higher, reload faster, and get more benefits from food and drink. These require serums, which you can make yourself by spending an obscene amount of caps at a vendor in the Enclave bunker, or more cheaply, buying them direct from another player's vendor. Luckily, other richer players have bought the plans themselves and make a good amount of caps selling them cheap to other players. I was a beneficiary of this scheme, and I thoroughly enjoyed my new identity as a mutated, kangaroo-hopping, chameleonic herbivore. I leaned into the food and drink systems, acquiring odd recipes and cooking up the most beneficial meals, all of which entailed long and meditative wanderings about the game world, picking up flora and other rare items. My handwritten notes on Fallout 76 resembles shopping lists for a post-apocalyptic menu of consumables, like brain bombs, steeped fever blossom tea, and Nuka-Cola dark. I adjusted my perk loadout to get even more benefits from food and drink, including alcohol and chemical stimulants, and I honestly fell in love with this system, going out shopping for ingredients for my cranberry relish and my sweet Labrador tea made a lot more sense than kangaroo hopping into the same old public events and daily quests. I started Fallout 76 like everybody else, role-playing as a survivor in the wasteland who needed weapons, armor, ammo, and consumables to stay alive. 300 hours later, and it looked like I was ending the game as an introverted gourmand. I cleaned out my own vendor of ammunition and legendary gear, and filled it up with drinks and recipes, and players bought them. I was all ready to pack it in and retire from the wasteland, having had my fill of shooting and looting, until this strange object of desire flashed in front of my eyes. The Thirst Zapper, a product of the Nuka-Cola Company. Normally a harmless squirt gun, it can be modded into a weapon that shoots explosive rounds of Nuka-Cola. Why would I want this? It's who I am! An anti-meta foodie who uses the various brands of Nuka-Cola to boost my health and action points and to reduce my radiation. Most players do this with chemicals, like stim packs and Rataway. I use Nuka-Cola, and my maxed out cola nut perk that triples the effects of these wonderful beverages has a permanent spot on my perk loadout. Now here comes a squirt gun that I can convert to an explosive weapon that uses Nuka-Cola as part of its ammunition. How can I resist? It is interesting that apart from grenades and mines, the Thirst Zapper is the only weapon in Fallout 76 whose ammunition ingredients include a food item. And on top of all that, the Thirst Zapper appealed to my dramatic instincts to root for the underdog. A recent thread on the Fallout 76 Reddit board addressed this issue, asking what is the weakest weapon in the game? 
a user responded, Nuka Thirst Zapper is the best weak weapon in the game because it's a squirt gun that does no damage, but also one of the most OP weapons in the game with weaponized Nuka-Cola ammo plans. The weakest can be the strongest. But nobody wants to use this thing. And why is that? Because you can't threaten someone with a squirt gun. That's right, Margaret. You can't threaten someone with a squirt gun. Unless you're threatening their dignity, but enemies in this game have no weakness to personal embarrassment. I mean, look at what they're wearing. A death sentence is too lenient for some of these crimes against fashion. And there's another reason nobody uses this gun. When the Thirst Zapper was introduced into Fallout 76 in December 2022, as part of the Nuka World on Tour DLC, a carryover from Fallout 4 in its own Nuka World DLC, players speculated that the Thirst Zapper might be the new meta of Fallout 76, until it was pointed out that the ammunition for the Thirst Zapper was incredibly difficult to make. Getting a Thirst Zapper is easy, that is, easy for Fallout 76. You can buy one at the Nuka World Arcade for 6,000 Nuka points, the game's 498th type of currency that can only be earned completing events that pop up around Nuka World or playing various inefficient minigames. One event gets you 5,000 points. So after just two events, you can get your grubby little hands on a brand spanking new candy-colored squirt gun. The problem is, it does no damage. If you want the gun to do damage, you need A, the plans to make Nuka-Cola weaponized ammo, and B, the ammo itself, which also comes in three types and has a whole other set of ingredients required to make them. Thirst Zapper ammunition has a unique identity in the game, which to me enhances its appeal. You cannot find this ammo anywhere in the game world. It doesn't drop from enemies, or appear in lootable containers, or get added to players' inventories as rewards for events. You can buy some at the same prize terminal where you bought the gun, but the amounts boggle the mind. 1,600 points for 6 rounds of Nuka-Cola ammo, 6,000 points for 6 rounds of Nuka-Cherry ammo, and a whopping 12,000 points for 6 rounds of Nuka-Quantum ammo. 6 rounds of ammo that cost twice as much as the weapon itself. To get a decent amount of ammo, therefore, it must be crafted. But again, as a unique type of ammo, it cannot be crafted at a tinker's bench with all the other ammunition. It must be crafted at a chemistry bench. And as you can see, the required ingredients, for good reason, makes the Thirst Zapper an acquired taste. Ingredients include full bottles of those respective Nuka-Colas, along with acid, crystal, copper, nuclear material, gold, and silver. And not just one of each. For Nuka-Cola Quantum Ammo, one round costs two acid, three crystal, four gold, and four nuclear material, along with the single bottle of Nuka-Cola Quantum. No wonder nobody uses this gun. No wonder on the Nukipedia Fallout wiki site, the page for the Thirst Zapper hasn't even been completed yet. Unless you're happy with maybe a few dozen or so rounds, and shooting off a weaponized squirt gun for a few laughs, building a character around the Thirst Zapper takes a commitment few players are willing to make. I, as it turns out, am one of those players. Before embarking on what would be my final marathon of grinding in Fallout 76, I spent some Nuka points on the Thirst Zapper and ammo mechanics. I wanted to see for myself how this gun worked with the three types of ammo, and whether the Quantum version justified a long-term investment of time and activity. I had four Zappers, one which is the regular, and then the other three with the three different ammo types. First, the regular Squirt Gun. Not really an ammo type and obviously and completely pointless. Let's now see how this works as an explosive gun. First, the Nuka-Cola regular ammo. Better than nothing, but close to nothing. Next, the Nuka-Cherry ammo. Better than the regular, but lacking power and reload efficiency. Finally, the Quantum version. And for this, I might as well activate the Grenadier perk, which doubles the radius of the explosion. Oh, man, that hits the spot. Hmm. 
My eccentric, foodie, introverted character just fell in love. But the grind way ahead. Quantum ammo costs a lot. Rarest of all is the Nuka-Cola Quantum itself, available at a few vendors and in certain spawn areas, but if that's all you're counting on, might as well hang it up. I invested instead in a Nuka-Cola Quantum Collectron for my camp, which does gather a steady, if minute, number of quantums. To accelerate this process and the gathering of other necessary ingredients like acid, crystal, gold, and nuclear material, I used my subscription to Fallout first to enter a private world where I could capture various workshops simultaneously that no other players would attempt to take over, as they might on a public server, and installed resource collectors for those ingredients plus an additional Nuka Quantum Collectron at each camp. While defending my workshops against enemy attacks, I made sure to use laser weapons that have a melting effect on enemies, creating more nuclear waste that I could pick up and drop in the stash. Additionally, I had to suffer the indignity of entering into power armor for the first time since learning how to make power armor in the main quest line over a year ago. I actually had to relearn the whole power armor system to construct a set of excavator armor that could collect crystal and gold ore in larger quantities that I could then smelt with acid at the chemistry bench to make crystal and gold. For style points, I made sure that the armor was Nuka-Cola branded. If I'm going to wear this Robocop trash, I might as well hawk my favorite beverage while I'm at it. And then there was the issue of ammo crafting quantity. With the perks I had, including Ammo Smith, Super Duper, and a two-star legendary perk called Ammo Factory, I could make three ammo for each bottle of Nuka-Cola Quantum, not just one. However, if I could max out the Ammo Factory legendary perk, I could make four ammo per bottle. To max out that perk, I needed an additional 250 perk points, the game's 499th currency that players earn by scrapping their perk cards. Since players receive one new card each time they level up and receive a perk pack of four cards each time they level up five times, with each card, when scrapped, giving the player two perk points, I calculated that I would have to level up 75 times to get the 250 points needed to max out the ammo factory card and get four quantum ammo for each bottle. So, along with the grinding for ingredients, I went on a grind for XP. Since I was already a gourmand, I knew how to increase my XP earning ability by consuming food items like brain bombs and cranberry relish, and I also made it a routine to get buffs from sleeping in my camp, wearing shielded apparel, opening lunch boxes, consuming magazines and bobbleheads, popping pills, and taking advantage of events and locations with a lot of XP earning potential. With over 60 intelligence and double XP percentages on a regular basis, I leveled up with the force of a geyser. As this was happening, as I focused my character on this single-minded pursuit of Nuka-Cola Quantum Ammo, it occurred to me that the greatness of Fallout 76, and I was convinced at this point that Fallout 76 was a great game, had more to do with what I was thinking outside of the game than anything I was doing inside of it. My choice of focus made the grind feel less like a grind and more like a pilgrimage a series of small movements towards a goal that would transform my character into a more idealized self. Like many things in life, as Marty McFly says, If you put your mind to it, you can accomplish anything. What did I want to accomplish? I wanted a very high number of Nuka-Cola Quantum Ammo for my Thirst Zapper. The higher, the better. The number in my head was about 1,500. Doing the math, if I wanted 1,500 ammo, I would have to, ah, uh, screw it. I needed at least 350 bottles of Nuka-Cola Quantum, plus 750 acid, 1200 crystal, 1500 nuclear material, and 1500 gold, and a maxed out ammo factory legendary perk card that required leveling up at least 75 times to get 250 perk coins. What you're seeing now is the scrapping of all the perk cards I earned through leveling up to make the 250 perk coins. To me, as strange as this might sound, this process defines the greatness of Fallout 76. You define your goal. 
You learn how to achieve that goal. You spend the time and resources needed to achieve it. And you watch as the numbers go up and up and up. And then you're ready. This is it. No more grinding. No more taking workshops in a private server. No more power armor. No more obsessive downing of consumables. This is the game's climax. The turning point. The peripatea. One giant step towards my personal end game. With all my materials and perks, I got myself over 1500 Nuka Cola Quantum Ammo. Mission number one accomplished. Mission number two, the gun itself. Yes, it has the Quantum Ammo modification, but it needs a legendary prefix that will enhance its power even more. This means relying on Dame Fortune, rolling legendary modules at the weapons bench. The popular Fallout 76 YouTuber Angry Turtle made a video about this and see how he rolls for a good prefix on a thirst zapper. For me, I'm looking for something like bloody. And so far, not very lucky with that. Getting nothing in exchange executioners. No. Another zealots. Stalkers. Exterminators. Juggernauts, it's all rubbish! Executioners again. Where's my bloody? Mutant slayers. My turn, let's roll. No. 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 Mother always said I was born lucky. With my unyielding armor set, I'm already used to low health gameplay, and so this little squirt gun that has a quantum ammo modification that does a base damage of 676, now as a bloodied quantum zapper, does over 1000. This can go higher. I take an adrenal reaction serum for a mutation that boosts my damage at low health even further. I equip perks like Grenadier, Nerd Rage, Demolition Expert, and Bloody Mess to boost it even higher. And I have plenty of drugs handy like Psycho Buff and magazines and bobbleheads that add even more damage. Now this unassuming little Thirst Zapper, formerly the weakest weapon in the game, can put out almost 2,000 base damage, which doesn't even include the additional damage done to multiple targets that will have the misfortune to be in the explosion's blast radius. But enough talk. Let's take this out for a drive, shall we? The sound you're not hearing is my constant laughter at what this gun is doing to the game world. Now it took a little while to get used to this gun. I blew myself up a lot. But even that was fun. I learned how to reduce the blast radius by taking off the grenadier perk which helped in indoor locations. This became the rule. Indoors grenadier off, outdoors grenadier on. I stopped blowing myself up and got used to one-shotting anything that crossed my path with Nuka Cola goodness. I made everyone and everything a Nuka Cola consumer. I don't know what other players thought about this. Some events that would normally be loud and chaotic turned very peaceful with me around. My thirst zapper, with its long range and wide splash radius, did tens of thousands of damage points on enemies that other players now did not have to inflict. At Moonshine Jamboree, after a few rounds of my zapper, we all just sort of stood around comparing clothing. 
I'd like to think no one actually died from my Nuka-Cola ammo, just got knocked out by the sugar rush and all that phosphoric acid. But even this got to be a little too much. After expending over a thousand rounds of Aquamarine Delight and hitting level 500, my character had reached a plateau from which there was nothing left to climb, at least none that I knew of. I found myself winding down into a planned hibernation. Having conquered the wasteland on my own terms, my character now serves the local community by making exotic alcoholic beverages like Nuka-Cola Dark, Tick Blood Tequila, and Rad Ant Lager. My billboard, hoisted above the shack where my strange neighbor was shooting at my lawn flamingos, advertises this service. And if you hit my vendor and my deconstructed riverside camp, you also see lots of plans, rare clothing, and magazines at reasonable prices. For now, I've canceled my subscription to Fallout first and moved on to other things. So as I put on my long johns and turn out the lights before going to bed for another long slumber, let me offer this conclusion. Playing Fallout 76 is like being handed 10 keys to unlock 100 treasure boxes. You can't unlock everything, but you can unlock 10 good boxes, depending on what you want. A lot of players don't like this game because they want something from it that just isn't there. A compelling story, a realistic virtual world, a glitch-free design, a tight gameplay loop that quote, respects your time. None of that is in Fallout 76. Critics of the game who harp on these issues are not wrong. They're just, let's say, unhelpful. It's like saying you don't watch Alfred Hitchcock movies because of the bad rear projection shots or that you don't read novels by Theodore Dreiser because of the grammar mistakes and overall awkward writing, or because you've never heard of Theodore Dreiser. Anyway, I'm not here to be unhelpful, although I wouldn't mind if the storyline in Fallout 76 were a little stronger, the environment a little more dynamic, and the gameplay a little less tedious. No, I'm here to be helpful, and I'm here to say that Fallout 76 is a great game. It's a great game without being very good. In fact, I would argue that the less you think about what constitutes good game design with Fallout 76, the fewer barriers there are to realizing its greatness. When you play enough hours of Fallout 76 and you go up enough levels, I would say 100 levels would be the minimum here. You realize that you're not playing a good game, or much of a game at all. Instead, you are part of a social experiment of individual character development in a group dynamic. As part of the experiment, you are both the experimenter and the subject. Your job as experimenter is to find out everything this game has to offer and then decide to do or get something specific that requires an enormous amount of effort to achieve. Your job as subject then is to go through the paces of the required effort and with time and a little luck, accomplish your goal. Meanwhile, your actions are being witnessed in a live setting by other players who serve as fellow experimenters and model subjects. Having accomplished what I think is my goal, and the beauty of this game is that you can create your own goal, I'm ready at level 500 to turn in for a while, maybe come back in a year or so, and see how my beverage seller is doing at the far west end of the Appalachian Forest. I hope by then my neighbor has recovered from her irrational fear of lawn flamingos, but I wouldn't mind if she didn't. Thanks for watching.